for organizing this. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about the ACL epidemiology and anatomy, but I noticed that my previous speakers in time-honored traditions just spoke what they wanted to, so I'll do the same. <laughs> so uh, knee injuries are pretty common, actually. So I don't know, how many of you, anybody over here have a knee injury? Yeah, a few of you, ACL injury? I mean, that's what I would expect in an audience of say, I don't know, 50 people, you would have a couple of people who, who would have ACL injuries. And uh, it is common presentation of, of all the sports injuries, uh, which uh, kind of constitute about 50% of consultation in the injury practice. And uh, obviously, it's an injury commonly seen in young people, and it's not that uh, they're more prone, and that's because they do take part in sports more or commonly, and as you get older, of course, you're uh, less often taking part in sports. So in my practice, about half of my patients are younger than 20, <coughs> and which is a bit difficult age group to manage. And uh, <coughs> though it's seen it more commonly in males, but again, it's for the same reason that uh, males, they are more, uh, kind of participate more in sports, but as female sports participation is increasing, we're seeing it more commonly in females. And females are actually more predisposed to get ACL injuries, and there are various factors for that. Uh, there are genetic factors, hormonal factors, and few anatomical factors. Females have a narrow notch uh, com for as compared to males, and so there's less space for ACL, so they have a higher risk of uh, having ACL injuries. So for the same sports, you're more likely, if you're a female, to have an ACL injury. So as females are taking part in more uh, sports, we're seeing more and more of ACL injuries. Uh, there are other things really which can make uh, people more predisposed to uh, ACL injuries. So if you see in this, uh, usually you get an ACL injury if you you, know, you have a kind of a foot planted and you're doing a cutting maneuvers as you call it, pivoting maneuvers and you femur turns internally and you get a valgus kind of uh, movement on the knee. So you get an abduction movement in the knee and uh, uh, females, if generally tend to land, as they tend to land, they, they tend to land with kind of uh, hips more straighter, knee more straighter, and kind of knees together. And lots of work has been go, uh, work gone on in prevention of these injuries, and they've been taught, females have been, they've been taught to land kind of with legs slightly apart, uh, less like, uh, uh, kind of with less ladylike sort of way, more legs by wider gait. So you don't have that much abduction force. And you, if your knees are bent a bit more, as you strain is taken by the muscles rather than the static structure of the ligament. So a lot of work has begun on injury prevention as well. And you can teach people how to land differently and how to move, how the movement factors also can be adjusted to reduce the risk of re, uh, for the injury to ACL. And uh, it's so uh, it's you get other thing is you build up the muscles not just at the knee. Uh, there's a lot of focus has been gone on building muscles in the knee, but if you improve their hip abductors and external rotators uh, as they land, their hip knee would not go into internal rotation and they're less likely they would uh, get uh, uh, an ACL injury. And it's, there are studies which have shown that if you take these measures, you can prevent this injury, especially in this, there are lots of programs. FIFA has got the program of prevention of injuries as school kids as well. And uh, it's, it's something we need to look at to prevent this injury because the numbers are going up and uh, for these injuries. Uh, we don't have much data from UK about this, and this data I'm afraid is from US, because US have a, a national college surveillance program, so they actually monitor people who have ACL injuries. And uh, in U US, uh, in women, it's actually uh, football or soccer, as they call it. But in UK, we see a lot more in netball, uh, in girls uh, who have ACL injury. And then, of course, uh, football is a common cause of injury in uh, UK. Uh, in winters, we see a lot of skiers uh, coming with ACL injury, and uh, of course, if you notice, it's uh, recreational skiers uh, who do occasional skiing. They are more likely to get ACL injury than people who are experts. So it just shows that conditioning makes a difference if you to get ACL injury. And same thing, you notice that uh, injury usually happens more often as you at the start of the season. People are not well conditioned, so they go into playing sports, and they're more likely to get injury. And also, it happens maybe towards the end of the game when the muscles are more fatigued. So the muscle conditioning is a big factor in uh, getting these injuries. And these days, of course, uh, one factor is the turf uh, you play on. Uh, there's a proliferation of artificial pitches. And they have more impact on the ground reaction force is much higher. 
and you get more forces going through the knee joint. So compared to a natural trail, artificial turfs are more uh, kind of higher risk of get, uh, getting to more damage to the joint. And the, as sports participation increases, we see more and more people getting their injuries. And uh, it's been said that in U in US, where there's lots of sport participation, about there's a five to ten percent chance that a kid would at least athletic kid would get an injury in their kind of before they pass out of the college. And it's not just that injury; it's about after injury as well. Somebody who has ACL injury, they're likely to get another injury. There's a very high risk of them getting another injury, either to the same knee or even the other side. So just because you've seen somebody with ACL injury, I think we have a responsibility about the future damage to the other joint as well. So obviously, if they go back to playing sport, they can damage the same knee, but there are other knees at risk as well. It's an equal risk of getting damage to the other knee. So I mean, ACL is, of course, uh, it's the ligament which is kind of goes right in the middle of the uh, knee joint, and it's a primary restraint to tibia, anterior translation of tibia. But more importantly, it's a primary restraint to the pivot, uh, kind of rotational uh, uh, forces, uh, which is what the patient usually complain of, that they get instability when they're turning uh, uh, around the knee, and the knee moves out of place, and they generally quite complain of coming that sort of, my knee moves out, they might point out, should demonstrate you when he moves out like that. And but the same thing, uh, same sort of twisting movement can cause ACL injury, but it can also cause the patellar dislocation as you uh, as you see the patellar moves out of place. And uh, this pivot thing is what, uh, pivot uh, shift is what you demonstrate as you can see in this, uh, when you examine them clinically. Uh, and that's what replicates this, uh, this pivot shift test is what replicates the instability maneuver which they can do in the sport, the cutting maneuver uh, which they do to while they're in sports. I mean, a ACL, it's a big ligament, but it's not that strong ligament. It's, it's no wonder it fa fails quite often. It's one of the commonest ligaments to tear. Uh, and, but, and it gets weaker as you get older. So somebody who's older who continues to play sports and have an injury, they're more likely to have a ACL injury easily. And uh, it takes about uh, 170 kilo to 250 kilos to tear it, but at a normal walking, you can have a force going through 50 to 60 kilos uh, through the joint. But if you have a sudden acceleration or de-acceleration, you can get uh, a force, easily force it to 170 kilograms. Uh, so you can imagine somebody who's had a sporting injury with significant forces going through the joint. It's very easy to tear. So we worry about these people, but then there's another group of people who are very kind of prone to injuring the ligaments, which we don't uh, kind of always identify because of momentum of forces, because of the mass they have. So a small twist and turn in these patients can tear the ligament very easily. And because they're big habitus, they're sometimes difficult to assess the ACL, and these patients quite often get missed. So think about these patients as well. Their injuries are not always uh, benign. Okay, uh, so when you see these patients, of course, uh, there's a, always a term, you, when you take a history, whether did you have contact, uh, was there a contact when you had the injury, or the, actually more often than not, these patients have no definite contact, it's when they're pivoting rather than a definite impact, as shown in this picture. You, the, you contact injury of something like that, which causes hyperextension, can tear ACL with, with the hyperextension, but, uh, more often, it's a uh, this menu uh, valgus and internal rotation of the femur, which kind of, kind of course can forces to go through the joint. And as the forces increase, these forces go from one side. If a small twist will tear just MCL, but as the force carry on, you have an injury to ACL, and uh, you can have a complete dislocation <coughs> if the forces don't stop, and uh, which is much more significant injury. Uh, from history, after of course, besides the mechanism, you need to give. You want to ask one point to them. Just ask them: Did your knee swell up after injury? And if they say yes, what does that tell you? The swelling after injury. They bled in the joint. So that's hemarthrosis. And if they get, if they, if somebody uh, after injury they have swelling, that worries me because that would suggest they've got hemarthrosis, and it's usually a significant reason for that hemarthrosis. And most of that common is ACL. There are other things like meniscal tears, <coughs> which can cause hemarthrosis, but meniscal tear swelling happens over 
kind of 24 hours or so. So they say my knee swelled up overnight. Well, unlike ACL swelling, which happens instantly, kind of within five to 10 minutes, the knee would swell up. And the other thing, like patellar dislocation or osteochondral fractures also, of course, which can cause this thing, him arthrosis. So it's actually not that difficult really to get a diagnosis of ACL. If somebody has injury and they have swelling, you think it's him arthrosis, you start worrying about them. Some of them may say pop as well, the knee felt, they felt a pop in the knee. And if you have these few findings, just from the history, you can pretty much confidently make a diagnosis that uh, they have ACL injury. If not, at least there's something significant which may need kind of more careful attention. So if you just want to take one take home message, I think that would be swelling after injury, something to worry about. Because these patients can be difficult to examine, so history is important. Uh, if you have to, Because they are painful to assess, so I mean, in medical school curriculum, you get taught about the draw test, and I don't know, we try to change that so often, but I think there's so much emphasis on draw test in medical school, but it's very difficult to do draw test with knee flex in somebody who's so painful. So Lachman tests uh, where you support uh, the leg uh, patients, uh, femur, and then try to translate tibia forward and feel for the soft end point. I think that's much more comfortable for the patient, and uh, it's easier to do. Uh, but it's important to assess collaterals as well. I mean, there's never a rush to treat ACL injury, but if their collaterals are gone, that brings them to territory of what's called a knee dislocation. That means there's much more significant injury. And those are the ones which need more immediate attention. So besides ACL, of course, think about the collaterals as well. And in that slight knee flexion, you can check the various and stress at the joint. ACL injury, you, you get, get confused by patellar dislocation and patient doesn't know what has happened and they sometimes feel that their knee moved out of place and they feel that petla has moved out of place. And it, even with experienced clinicians sometimes they find it difficult to discriminate. So any patient who say, tells you that my petla has dislocated, I think you need to rule out whether the ACL has gone or civil vice versa. If their ACL is gone, you need to rule out whether the petla has uh, dislocated or not. And it's easy enough in the same position if you try to push petla laterally, if they get uh, apprehension or discomfort, you need to think it might be patellar dislocation rather than an ACL injury. How are we doing the time? Okay. So, I mean, treatment, uh, I, I guess, uh, as a surgeon, I would say that you think about surgery, but, uh, but you think about surgery when patients have symptomatic instability, and uh, we talked about patellar instability before. Uh, same injury can cause patellar dislocation, but patients. ACL typical instability is usually in pivoting maneuvers. When patients have petlar related uh, giving way, which is different from petlar instability when they dislocate, they, their knee gives way because of they got petlar degeneration and they got petlar femoral pain, their knee gives way because of pain. And there is quite often you need to identify where the, uh, why the reason of their giving way is. If their petlar femoral pain cause get inhibited and the knee gives way, it may happen when they're coming downstairs or walking in straight line. ACL doesn't cause pain. ACL typically instability is twisting when you uh, can then they do pivoting. So just be aware of that. But uh, I think there have been studies on uh, whether you try to do primary conservative treatment or surgery straight for these patients. And there was this paper in BMJ which published a uh, few years back. And they suggested that the outcomes are same if you even if you delay reconstruction. Uh, so this is a, for the economic reason it may be better give everybody a trial of conservative treatment, only do surgery for if they have persistent instability. But if you look at close uh, in this paper, the <coughs> stability in the patients who had delayed reconstruction were poorer, and these patients had a higher risk of, uh, of recurrent meniscal injuries. And a lot of patients, about half of the patients crossed over from non-operative to operative measures. I mean, we have an ongoing trial going on right now called SNAP trial, which may help give some more answers. But uh, Worry is that if you treat, let these patients be, and they continue to have instability, they get more meniscal tears, and which cause more damage. And the ACL surgery, quite often, is just to prevent the further meniscal damage, uh, besides providing stability to the joint. So, but that's the worry. If you continue non-operative treatment, they'll get more meniscal tears, uh, which actually has a, a kind of impact on the long-term outcome. So, let it be. But. Uh, 
it financially also I think sometimes makes sense getting these patients back to work and it's uh, in terms of cost effectiveness uh, or at least in recent time has a uh, kind of better outcome for the society, overall for the society. So I think I'll leave there. So persistent instability after ACL can cause meniscal damage. I think that's something you need to worry about. Thank you.